Welcome to episode 233 of the Barcelona Podcast, home to the most influential voices in the FC Barcelona community, brought to you by the Blue Wire Podcast Network. I'm Dan Hilton, and I'm again joined by Francesco Moss, Barca columnist featured on ESPN, The Guardian, and of course, the Barcelona Podcast. I want to say happy holidays, Frances, but I'm a little worried that Ronald Koeman and the club are going to give us a pile of coal. Well, it's the, it's the situation we have. Uh, we can't control that. I think that we all are coolest, of course, I should have said that first. <laughs> Um, we just have to react to everything that the, the team throws our way. Um, having a transition season is difficult, uh, but you know we are here to because we appreciate the club. We're not here because of the players themselves. We're here because of this one, the batch. So we just need to keep going. Times are not always going to be rosy, but we need to, we need to endure it and then try and appreciate what we get when it's positive. Yeah, I don't know if you're going for the pun there, but obviously you threw out my wife's name in there. And for me... <laughs> Being in quarantine all the time, everything has been rosy for me just because of... Uh, Lucky you. you know, but Lucky you. Anyway, one of the themes leading into this show is we are being... I guess it's about Ronald Koeman. That's what it is. Ronald Koeman is basically the theme of our show. And one of the questions from our close listener, our close Facebook listener group is, are we being too hard on Koeman right now? And we have a ton of questions on why we should be even harder on Ronald Koeman in terms of our criticism of him. So let's get right into those listener questions today. We start with one from Mo Taha Ali. What is your most favorite and least favorite thing about Komen so far? And he can, we're not allowed to talk about the treatment of Ricky Pouge once again. I think we did enough of that on last week's show. So let's skip I'm that. So, so sans Ricky Pouge, what is the, the most positive thing so far about Komen? And what is the most negative thing about Komen in his tenure? Okay. Most, best, most positive thing is the fact that he's trusting the youngsters. Um, obviously, we can't mention Ricky Puig, so we're going to leave that one out. But the fact that Mingueza, Araujo, um, Ansu Fati, obviously he's injured now, um, Pedri, for example, Trincao coming in pretty much every single match. Um, I think that in four or five years' time, we'll look back and we'll see that, you know, the, the, there were little seeds planted during this season. Um, obviously, they're not La Masia youngsters, but I think Serginho Des and even Frankie the Young can be put in the same, the same boat, really. Um, they are getting regular playing time day in, day out. And uh, I think that is really, really important. Um, they're not perfect and, you know, no one really is. But I think that unless you trust these players to grow, they're never going to. So I think that is a huge, huge positive. Um, the main negative for me is the fact that he's not, he's not managed to click just yet. He hasn't found a way to unbalance matches, particularly in the second halves. Um, he's been quite stubborn with his formation. 4-2-3-1, I think, in theory, works, but it cannot be the be-all and end-all. Um, to be honest, I do like when the Young and Pedri are playing together sort of as a double pivot, but effectively they're not because they, you know, they break the lines with their conduction or they drift towards either side. So I think that is uh, I mean, quite intelligent, quite interesting variation that has happened lately so I think that being stubborn with his formation is, is one of the things but I think that the fact that in the second half he doesn't really seem to know what to do with the substitutions I think that's a that's a major negative that I'm sure the vast majority of our audience are still you know banging their heads against the wall for yeah you mean you're talking about the substitutions yesterday in particular against Valencia and I think that was the most mismanaged match that Coleman has had so far because I think the players against Valencia gave enough for a manager to push them over the line. 2-2 wound up being a fair result for two teams that, I mean, Valencia, for those who, and everyone kind of knows their backstory as well, their management and their president, Peter Lim, has basically said, I don't really care so much about this, this team and this squad and, and this club. And so they wound up selling off all of their major players, any player that could go for more than 15 million euros, and they even let their captain, Danny Parejo, walk on a free transfer. So for Barcelona, they can look in the mirror of Valencia and say, well, this could have gone even worse for us. I mean, our captain, Messi, is still at the club. Uh, but that didn't stop Valencia from, you know, having a, a, a good match. And their captain, Gaia, helped propel them to a 2-2 draw. But as we say, if Coleman had done things a little bit differently, and it is puzzling that you wind up having a 2-2 um, you're at home, so you're, you would like to win 3-2, and the subs wind up being Langley, well, Trincao, and then Langley and Pjanic, and we're going to talk about Trincao a bit uh, in a few minutes. We have a question on him as well, but yeah, I, I think for the most positive and least positive, uh, for me, the, the, the most positive is the easy one. I mean, this week, basically, for me, at least on content side of things, has been Pedri week, 
Because again, I think against Real Sociedad, he was the best player on the field and helped them get three points against a top three team in the league this season. And then coming even against Valencia, um, was he one of the top players? I mean, not necessarily. Alba had a really good match. Araujo obviously stood out for better or worse. And Messi was also very good. But Pedri was solid. And Pedri, I put him in the same category with Dest, who against Valencia had one of his worst matches of the season. Yet Dest was just fine. He wasn't bad. He was just fine. He had to worry about defensive uh, acumen because Valencia kept throwing everything down his side of the field. So he had to simply focus on defending. And that was fine for Dest. And the other side for Pedri, he had, uh, it wasn't even a poor match. It was fine. He was playing as almost as a double pivot. But in that first half, obviously, three formations. This is another negative about, uh, I see positive or negative. I, I, as so it's going to be, I'm going to quickly move on to this question by saying, for me, it's almost a positive and a negative that Coleman, he's not pragmatic in a way that Valverde was. And he seems to be stubborn, but in the same way, when he, when he changes things up, he seems to be throwing things against a wall. Which, is, which just seems to be too extreme. So it's not that he's being too, too stubborn a thing, where even yesterday, this is on the point of Pedri, he started in a 4-3-3. At halftime, he moves to a 4-2-3-1 when he replaces Busquets with De Young, and he ends the match in a 3-4-3. A there we go. Yeah. So three different formations used yesterday against Valencia in a 2-2 draw. And so it wasn't that he was stubborn with formation. It was that the starting lineup that he put out, and this is where the stubbornness comes in a bit, where... The idea that you cannot bench Coutinho because he's good enough to give you something simply has not worked when you're pairing him with, I mean, Pedri in a sense is a number 10 as well, but he wasn't playing as one, but you have Pedri a number 10, you have Griezmann a number 10, you have Messi a number 10, and then you also add Brothwaite up to the penalty box up there as a number nine. And then you're going to throw Coutinho on the field and all of them are going to fit together and have enough chemistry and jive well enough. And Coutinho winds up being the odd man out every time. So, I mean, even when you put Trincao in on the right side with Messi still on the field, and because Messi doesn't really come out, that was a game that was calling out for Conrad De La Fuente, not because I'm biased for De La Fuente, but you needed a left winger. And Fati and Dembele are on the shelf, and you need to put a left winger in the game, and he didn't do so when he had one on the bench. And I know it's a Barca B player, sure, but it's still the player that fit the situation, and that's what makes it so puzzling. So, for me, his, his approach to these matches – there seems to be a willingness. It's not that he's so stubborn he doesn't change. But when he does change, it seems to be quite puzzling. I think that's both the positive and the negative. So let's move on quickly to an adjacent question. And Tara asks, if you could give one piece of advice or a suggestion to Coleman, Frances, what would it be? That's a very good question. Um, I haven't really thought about it. I would probably say uh, be consistent with trusting the youngsters. Um, it sort of links to the question that we had before. I think that this season, I don't think we're going to win anything. Um, they were saying in Catalonia Radio just now before I, I came on the podcast, they were saying, we haven't really lost La Liga just yet, but we will. And I think that is quite obvious. Um, I think that there are stronger teams in La Liga. There are stronger teams in Europe as well. And I don't, really don't see this team having enough growth to be able to challenge for the titles, which is what Barca is about. Um, and, you know, this is, I don't think it's being too pessimistic. I think this is being realistic because, you know, we've got a, a good enough sample size now. At some times, bars are good. Sometimes bars are better, but then they go straight back down. And uh, we see that throughout the games as well. So during the first half, maybe because of this stubbornness with the formation, Barca seem to know what they're doing. And uh, when it starts being an exchange of punches, so a game of up and down transitions, that's when bars are, are at their weakest. Um, they don't seem to have enough quality, which I think if you look at the squad, it is quite clear, uh, not because of the names, but because of the output they week in, week out. Uh, players like Griezmann and Coutinho, um, and even Dembele, but I think particularly the first two, on paper, they should win you games, but in, effectively they don't. So I think that it is quite clear that based on the output that these players are given, we are not superior to pretty much any team that we're facing these days. And that could be Levante, that could be Leganés, that could be Valencia, that could be all sorts of teams. Um, and Cadiz, for example, Alaves, we're just not superior anymore. So I think that... If Barca are to win and sort of go over the hurdle, they need something extra. And at this moment in time, I think you've got three players in the team that can beat defenders, which is Messi, Dembele, and Fati. And the last two are not really in the squad because of injuries. And Messi is not the Messi that we've seen over the last 10, 15 years. So when you put all of that into an account, it is very hard to answer the question. But these are all the thoughts that pop to my head. 
Yeah, it's hard to say. And that's the question about the almost a contradiction of speaking about Coleman in regards to the youngsters where mm -hmm. he's played. He's, I don't know whether or not Pedri's talent was enough to just get him into the squad, any squad, regardless of the manager. I think Pedri has shown you that he had enough tools that any manager would have been able to put him in a position to see, uh, succeed, if you will. And same thing with Fati, where you, uh, for Fati, as good as he started the season as Barcelona's leading goal scorer, I think any manager would have said, well, yeah, this kid's the best left winger we have. He needs to start these matches. I think most would have said that. So I don't know how much credit you give him in the same way that he did go after Dest and he winds up starting Dest a lot. Even the courage where, you know, as much as Mingueza and Araujo were, to me, both the reason why Barca were able to get the two goals, uh, especially the, the goal by Araujo, Mingueza was the one who keeps it in. And it winds up bouncing to the feet, the feet of Araujo and then a side volley. Where did that come from? His first, first Barca goal. Congratulations to him. But the courage that he had where last week on the show, you and I were very critical of Lang Lei. We said that Lang Lei has basically not deserved his starting spot. And in the two matches since then, Coleman has started Araujo and Guetha. And you're taking He's your good. Lunch. Right. And you're, you're taking your lunch. really, really, really highly of a, of a coach that knows what he's doing from time to time, not with everything. But... Yeah. We've had Setien, we have Alverde, they wouldn't have done that. They would have just stuck with the big names. And in this, in this case, Lenglet is the bigger name than the two that you mentioned. So that is, you need to give the manager credit for that. Not for everything, but for particular cases. I think that in five years' time, we'll be grateful for this. Right. With two 21-year-old center backs, you're going to take your lumps. And that first goal that they conceded in particular against Valencia, I think was maybe the worst goal they conceded of the year because the copy was a wide, wide, wide open. And that is a communication breakdown where you just don't have a leader. And we were, when we spoke about last week about PK and him, and him being gone, sure, there are things about PK where his pace lets him down in the way that Araujo, uh, it doesn't let him down. And for PK, he also has his issues from time to time with, with his form, sure. But you can clearly tell he's the vocal leader back there, and that player is missing, where there was no communication between Griezmann and Araujo. And that's why Dekabi is so wide open. So that's a learning experience for both Mingueza and Araujo. And Mingueza in particular, offensively, he's been very, very helpful. And he's been exactly what you'd want him to be. But defensively, Mingueza has been the player that I was worried about at Barca B level, where individual mistakes are really letting him down. I mean, he was beaten. If not for the, uh, the, the save by Ter Stegen, he winds up getting beaten pretty badly in that first half and in, in the second half. Obviously, the goal for Maxi Gomez comes. Uh, he's largely at fault because he's the one who gets beat in just a, a simple one-on-one -on -one move by uh, Maxi Gomez. So, yeah, it's a thing where Coleman is playing the youngsters, but then we can also argue that uh, Conrad, Alenia, and Puj would have been much more fitting to help that game than Lengle, Trincao, and Pjanic was. So, uh, yeah, it's almost... I think, I think that would be very obvious. I think that pretty much everyone listening to the podcast would have seen that... Um, I think Kuman's stubbornness, once again, is the one that it doesn't let him see that Ricky Puig would have changed that game. Um, but Alanya and Conrad deserve the time as well. Um, but, you know, if Coutinho scores the last shot, then we win 3-2, we may not be talking about this, you know? So um, I think that the key thing for Barca is to score the many opportunities they're creating. I mean, I, did, I stopped counting at the end, but at one stage, late in the second half, it was over 20 shots on goal. Um, with 20 shots on goal, you've got to win the games. And uh, if you don't have the couple of hiccups at the back that, as you already explained, Mingetha had, uh, and, you know, youngsters are going to make mistakes. And I'm happy, to be honest, I'm happy to take those bumps along the way for sure. Yeah, me too. Uh, but with, tw with 20 shots on goal, you've got to win the game. So I think that, that that is the key reason. We're not finishing. Uh, and also, we're getting very close to the edge of the, of the area and we're not taking the shots. Um, and no one really takes a deflection. Most of the balls seem to be going back to Messi. And Barca's attack are really, really, really obvious. So out of the 20 shots, clear chances, there weren't many. So I think that we need to be more incisive up front and we need to find better solutions. And when we do take the shot, um, needs to be not always expected, but also, you know, having an element of surprise in there. So there are different ways that we can make this work. It just isn't going our way just yet. So we seem to be going through these listener questions as well, almost answering them on the fly. Michael had asked, will Coleman ever budge and change formation? Were we stuck playing the 4-2-3-1? And the answer to that is simple, that yes, he changed it three times uh, against Valencia to try to see what would work. But the, the thing that we keep talking about is it's a similar players that he's trusting. So regardless of the formation you're putting him, putting them in, they wind up only working so well together. As we said, there's a log jam in number 10 position. So it's not necessarily a stubbornness for the formation. Merely it is a stubbornness with the combinations of players that you have because you can't 
or is refusing to drop those with very, very high price tags, which you know who we're talking about. Same thing with Brad asking, why has Cullen been so stubborn with not letting some players come in? I don't know if it's being stubborn about the players that he's not letting play. I think it's more being stubborn with the players that are playing that he continues yeah. to put out there that are basically freezing out the other ones. So yeah. I, it, it's, it's a weird way to answer that, but it, yeah, it's, it's kind of more about the ones that are already in than the ones that are to come in. Now, Xavier asked, how should Coleman rotate the midfield effectively? What partnerships do you see working? Should DeYoung and Pedri play most games? And I think we answered this about three weeks ago as well. And I, I'm just going to reiterate the same thing that uh, almost an update to it, that we thought Pianic would slowly, uh, we knew that he had COVID at the start of the year. We think that he would slowly get his fitness up. And he's even come out and said that his minutes are too low than he would like. Just looking at them, it would actually surprise you how little he's played in the league this season. He started most of the Champions League, but that was against Ferran Varos and Dinamo Kiev on the back half of that. Um, and against Juventus when, that match, all they had to do was, okay, I don't want to rehash that, but we know what happened there. <laughs> Wound up being second in the group. So as far as Pedri and uh, De Jong, Pedri being the double pivot, I still don't think should be the answer. I think Benching Coutinho needs to be the answer, and Pedri is a starting 11 player up top. To me, at this moment, he should be on the left until Fati comes back, that being Pedri on the left wing. The, the double pivot, to me, is either De Jong or Pjanic as a duo, or Busquets and Alenia or Busquets and De Young farther forward as he did against Real Sociedad. Uh, I know I listed those. I, I mean, I don't know if you want me to throw those out, those, uh, out there again, but to me, those are the three combinations that should work. Not that Alenia and De Young wouldn't work, but I think to me that's almost a fever dream that he's going to keep Busquets and Pianic out at the same time. So I think you get the idea that that would work, but Busquets, I think his skill set is most complemented by another player from the academy in Alenia in the way that De Young, I think, is best complemented by Pianic or you have Busquets as a defensive midfielder back in that area of the field where he was comfortable in front of the back four, and you push the young farther forward as he did against Ralph Sociedad. Not playing between the lines is almost a number 10, but basically playing as a, almost a box-to-box -box number eight, which is not the way that we think the young's profile is, but it's the only way that he succeeded this year under Coleman. And Pjanic, as we said, his minutes are absolutely puzzling. And then against Valencia, he looks at Busquets, who's taken off at halftime because he was so poor in that first half, which is unfortunate um, as he was. And again, not to defend Busquets, but when I saw that it was Brothwaite, Coutinho, Messi, Griezmann up top, and then you added Pedri as, in theory, uh, the other double pivot, I knew that it was going to be a rough day for Busquets at the office, and indeed it was. And so I don't think Busquets, he was poor, but I also don't think he was put in any situation to succeed in that match and cover the ground that he was expected to when, as we talked about two weeks ago now, when Coutinho and Messi lose the ball in particular, when they're supported up top by Brothwaite and Griezmann, no one is in a position to press and get the ball back other than Pedri. And so he winds up running himself ragged all over the field. You saw when Pedri came out of that game, he was exhausted. And I think the 17 or now 18-year-old deserves a little bit of a rest because he is running himself uh, almost to death where he and, again, a lot of credit to Alba. We've been on Alba. He doesn't run enough. But he put up the miles yesterday, or the kilometers for you uh, <laughs> in the UK or everywhere around the world. He put up the kilometers yesterday, did Alba, and deserves a lot of credit for his performance. But as far as Busquets goes, uh, he could try to cover as much ground as he likes, but he doesn't, A, have the physical tools to do it, and B, the things in front of him do not support that. So how would you situate these partnerships? I mean, I don't think you would agree that they need to be set, but how would you rotate? I would think that Busquets needs to be an option off the bench uh, from tomorrow morning. Um, I think that, you know, if you are taking this season as a season to build for the future, then Busquets has no place in it. Um, I think that you need to play the young, you need to play Pedri, and you need to get some playing time to Alanya and, and Ricky Puch as well. Um, I think that Busquets needs to be an option off the bench. Um, I think Pjanic needs to be an option off the bench too, to be honest, um, based on what we've seen. Um, I think that the double people works best, or let's rephrase that, the double people only works if you've got both of them jumping off the position, um, because you know otherwise that we don't have enough players up front, uh, and I think that a player that's got more recorrido, they got you know the ability to run from the second line is what Barca needs at this moment in time, and Busquets just cannot do that. Um, this team needs someone who can add something special, something different when they're outside the area, and Busquets is never ever ever going to take a shot. I think that in his whole career he's taken three, and he's been playing twenty years, so. Everyone knows that Busquets is always going to pass the ball around. Um, everyone knows that Busquets is most of the time going to give the ball to Messi or to, 
in this case, um, Serginho there's overlapping from the right because he's obviously Escorado, he's obviously drifting towards that side. And that's a player that is that predictable and, you know, is not as effective defensively and, and, and taking the ball off the opponents as he once was. He's just not a player that can play as much time as, as he's been given, to be honest. I know it is harsh. I know that he's a Barca legend. I know that Barca in the last 10 years don't win pretty much a quarter of what they, they won without Busquets. But right here, right now, I think Busquets needs to be an option off the bench because, you know, you're not going to get any profit from selling him on or anything like that. But um, he can be a good teacher. He can be a good role model. And uh, he can take the La Masia sort of DNA forward. But he needs to be there to help the others, not just be a solution himself, unfortunately. Yeah, I think it's situational, too. I mean, Valencia, it takes five minutes to do the scouting report on Valencia. They wanted to get up and down this season, and they have been so helter-skelter with Jekyll and Hyde in terms of getting up and down the field. They wanted an open game. And so Busquets is no longer an option for an open game. And you see on paper that you look across the Liga, and I don't know how many matches of other teams you've watched, but I try to tune in when I can. And I know that against Real Sociedad, who like to attack, 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 Busquets was maybe not the best option, though he did play well in the situation that De Young was, where, where De Young was put on the field. But I think back to the Celta de Vigo game. Celta de Vigo are, for better or worse, going to go, 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 and Busquets is not the option for that. On Tuesday against Real Valladolid, or tomorrow, for those, uh, for those listening, against Real Valladolid, that is a match where you want to control the pace. You know that they're going to probably put either it's a 4-4-2, which is what they played, or they might even play a 5-4-1, and that's a situation where you want Busquets at the top of the box there to continue to spray passes, diagonals, and create things to bring in crosses in the way that he does. So Busquets is going to be more situationally correct for a Real Valladolid leader, even a good team like an Adafe. He, the Adafe more fits what Busquets is going to give you in a game and take control of the pace of that game. But teams like Valencia, like Celta de Vigo, that's not a situation for Busquets, and it takes two minutes of scouting. I mean, you know that his assistants and even him watch as much football as possible. And so you have to make sure you're making the right personnel decisions for these matches. And that's where you start to question what he's doing. However, Enrique does ask, when are we going to stop blaming it all on the manager and start really holding the players accountable? I don't think it's the players themselves. I think it's the board. Um, I think that the players are accountable for what they do on the pitch. But ultimately... The players didn't choose themselves to come to Barca. They were signed. They were chosen. They've been paid big bucks to come and do a job. And um, if Messi looks around, he's got no Xavi, no Iniesta, but not even Pedros or Villas or even Ibrahimovic at some stage. You know, there's no Eto, there's no Ronaldinho, there's no Deco, there's no one around, really. You've got Griezmann, who is a shadow of the FIFA player that watches, you know, we watch on the PlayStation from time to time. Coutinho is nowhere near close to the level he showed at Liverpool or even a Bayern Munich, which was, you know, the season after we offloaded him. So if those two are the players that need to help Messi, then apaga y vamonos, just turn off the TV and get out the door because Messi just really doesn't have as much support as he needs. I mean, the, the, the main cast around him, which was Dembele and, and Ansu Fati, they're injured. Um, the, the, his team are making far too many mistakes in set pieces. And, you know, you cannot really blame Mingueza for making the mistakes himself because he's young. He will make mistakes. But why is Mingueza playing? Mingueza's playing because Piqué is injured and because the second option is Lenglet, who's also been really poor. Umtiti has been injured, not replaced. And I could go on and on for another two and a half hours. But the point here is the squad is very poor. The, squ- the squad is not good enough to compete with the Bayern Munichs of the world. And um, unfortunately, not even with the Atleticos and even Real Madrid's at, 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 at domestic level. And it pains my heart to say this, but that is why we've got an election coming around the corner. I'm not saying that the players have got no blame themselves, but, you know, this is a con- competitive business and our team is just not competitive enough if you go player by player based on what they're showing on the pitch. Obviously, you could say the manager should be able to take more out of them, but how many more minutes, how many more hours of football can you give Griezmann or... Coutinho to actually show themselves. You really can't. And uh, obviously, the other option is bench them both. But then again, if you do that, there's no resale value when the new president comes on. So it's a catch-22 here that it's just not going to, at the moment, be much positive, unfortunately. Yeah, and I mean, it's unfortunate. Business is business. And so for me, if I'm a new president that comes in and I have a week uh, at the end of January, 
I'm actually going to try to sell Coutinho. And we had a question about this yeah. on another different page. I'm going to try to sell Coutinho as quick as possible because we've been talking about his resale value since 2017 now. So you just mm -hmm. have to get him off the books and end that chapter. And I know it's ruthless. I know it's tough. But again, football is a business. So uh, the idea of, I mean, all these La Masia players who dream of playing at the camp know 99% of them or 98% of them know that they're going to at one point either not be resigned and have to leave for somewhere else, or they're going to be sold off when they hit the 21, 22, 23 years old and they're playing in Barca B. And that's something that the youngsters who dream of playing at the camp know have to realize. So continue, obviously, as a world-class player, and I use that term very loosely, but that's what his price tag tells you, that he's a mm. top, top world-class player, that he should understand that, that football is a business. And as ruthless as it is, he certainly is the odd man out here. Not to say that Griezmann's been good enough, but Griezmann – he fits in some ways and he might not fit with Messi, which is really important, but moving yeah, forward, if this is agree. Messi's last season, you have the, the, the idea that Griezmann will help carry you next year is still very possible. If you bring in a number nine, like an actual, not, no offense to Martin Brathwaite, but you bring in a top, top number nine as well, that Griezmann's going to play off of. And Messi is uh, either having fun in Paris with Neymar or he's in Man City. Then the potential for Neymar, I mean, for Antoine Griezmann to, to do much better makes sense off of a, a top, top number nine. And then again, Coutinho still winds up being the odd man out because his position on the field is taken and there are better players. I mean, I'm going to say, if you made me choose between Fati and Coutinho, it's Fati nine times out of 10. I mean, if you're going to make me choose now, even this year, Pedri has been better than Coutinho. So if I choose between Pedri and Coutinho, I choose Pedri. And so you've already replaced him in this squad by teenagers. So it's redundant. So I would say for the one player to offload in January, uh, other than I think, um, uh, no, uh, it's unfortunate, but Alenia and Puj have to look very hard at whether or not they should go out on loan um, and return to the club. I think they have a place just not under Coleman. And I don't think Coleman's going to be here uh, for next season. So I think those two need to go out on loan and Coutinho should probably be sold. And those are the only three things that I would do in January. I would have loved Untiti as well. I agree with I mean, that. If you can, he's... if you can, yeah. Yeah, I agree yeah but no, no one's going to buy him and no one's going to pay him the wages that you're paying, which is, um, you know, very, 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 very unfortunate. It's a horrendous error of judgment. But then again, he was very good in his first one, two seasons for Barca. Then he got injured and then that's when he got his renewal, which no one really understood at the time. But, you know, hopefully he'll come back and get fit and he just isn't. So I think that that is something that we could get off the books as well. But, Unfortunately, there's, this doesn't seem to be a way out with him. Yep. Yeah, for sure. Uh, absolutely not. Now, one of the youngsters that we haven't mentioned when we mentioned the youngsters who are succeeding is Trincao. And Minor asked about this, and I, I, I did get some thoughts on this question as well. Dinesh also had a question about this. How much you guys liking Trincao? Would Conrad be a better option? I'm finding Trincao to be a bit underwhelming. You and everyone else, Minor. And then Dinesh asked, why is Coutinho still starting for us? Well, we answered that. But why is Trincao brought on for the last 10 to 12 minutes in every match when it's clear that he cannot have the impact off the bench. Now, I did the numbers here. Here are the numbers for Trincao. He's played in 13 matches and averages 20 minutes per game. So not 10, but 20 minutes per game and half a shot per game. He has one assist on the season, just 18.2 touches per game when he comes on, 0.3 key passes, and not a single big chance created this season. The positives, he does average more than one successful dribble per game, but loses the ball more than five times per game. So that's a negative. All in all, the stats back up the eye test that he just has not been good enough. Now, when he was at Braga, I watched him between 10 and 13 times whenever I, could, whenever I could find him. And at Braga, he did cut inside much, much more. But obviously, you have Lionel Messi, the, a giant, <laughs> standing at his stature, standing in the middle of the field, where he operated best at Braga. And even, if, uh, even at Braga, he was more willing to go one-on-one -on -one down the sideline. So the, the player that I saw at Braga is not the one who's arrived at Barcelona, as we see with many, many players. And his touch mm -hmm. as well, you can see his confidence is suffering because his touch got worse from when he was a 19-year-old to now being a 20-year-old uh, at Barcelona. To me, it's a matter, as we've talked about before about Trincao, I know it's tough, just like Mingueza or Araujo or Dest, to take your lumps and not, I mean, not every teenage player, not every youngster is Fati or Pedri, who are truly special talents. And I don't want to take for granted how good those two are and just how much better they are than every teenager around them in the world. They are top 10 teenagers in world football. That's how good Fati and Pedri are. And so for Trincao, I'm not giving up on a 20-year-old who is so highly rated by multiple clubs as well. I know he has a super agent, and I know that makes everybody raise their eyebrows. 
Um, but this may just not be his year. And as much as Coleman is trying to force it for him to get his confidence and be a better player and be the player he was at Braga, with Messi in the middle and with him not having a willingness to try to go outside as he did, the physical tools are there and he was highly rated and I saw much better than what I see now. So I'm not all out on Trincao, but, but unfortunately, yes, if that does mean that he's going to not come into games, if that means that he just has to take a back seat, train really hard, get used to playing, uh, quote unquote, the Barca way, then that's what happens to him this season. And you hope that it doesn't strip him of all the confidence he has. But if you're going to buy a player for 30 million euros, they have to, in between the years, be good enough to be able to say, hey, I'm building, I'm 20 years old, and next year will be my moment. Or the, even the year after when Messi is no, definitely next, the following season, we know that Messi will no longer be at the club. So there will be opportunities in the future for Trincao. And it, as you said, it's a transition year. And he's certainly one of the we're very lucky that he's one of the only young players along with Puj and Alenia that we have to take our lumps with. Yeah, I think that not every player can play for Barca. I think it's much easier to play at Betis and Levante, etc. And obviously Braga, with all due respect, playing at Barca is different. And I think that one of the factors we cannot forget is that the Camp Nou is empty. I think that has really, really helped Trincao in this situation because if... Um, He's not been as effective as we would have liked, which I think is pretty obvious. And I think that, you know, every, pretty much everyone in our audience seems to agree with that. There would have been some run run in the Camp Nou already, which is the little money, you know, 70 year old saucy going, oh, I get you, no, no, far either, you know? So all of that would have been uh, whenever Incao gets the ball. And he hasn't heard it just yet. You know, I think it happened to Bojan Kirkik as well. Uh, Bojan was fantastic coming through La Masia. He's the top goal scorer in La Masia history, but you know he was commentating in being sports the other day, being sports Spain, and he's 30. So this is something that Trincao needs to be counting his chickens really, really, really lucky for. I mean, yes. Boyan was also really great, not only in the academy, but when he arrived. His first yes. year at, with Barcelona, he was one of the main reasons why they captured the trophies that they did. I want to add that too, that he was very good on start and they turned on him in a second. So that situation is even worse than the one when Trincao. Exactly, exactly. And he was one of our own. He was yeah. you know, homegrown by us. Um, not Portuguese. Was, I'm not going to say and, that's another reason why, but that's another thing that gives Trincao a short leash. Unfortunately, anyone that we've paid for um, has got a far, far, far smaller amount of patience um, you yeah. know, by, by the name. Um, Trincao is a youngster. Trincao is someone that I think we need to trust. He's someone that we know can be very good. But I think that, as you've already mentioned, it just go back, goes back to Messi. If Messi leaves this summer, Trincao will grow. Griezmann will grow. Uh, if Messi stays, then Trincao may, you know, may not grow as, as we are trying to, to, to expect from him and hoping that, that he will become one day. And he may need to be sold elsewhere. You know, we had good offers at the beginning of the season before he even started playing for us from the Premiership, uh, reported around 50 million euros for him already. Um, and there were reports he was going to be sold, um, not just around, I'm not going to say any outlet names, but, you know, outlets around the world, but also within the Catalan media, Mundo Deportivo and Sport, and even Catalonia Radio were saying this. So if they're reporting it, there's got to be some, some leakage, there's got to be some source from inside the club that, unfortunately, that shouldn't happen, but it does. And it's happened for the last 50 years. It's not going to stop now. So, yeah, I think that having him play for 20 minutes, I don't have a problem with. Um, I think we've got five substitutions. We don't always use them. I think Trincao does have a spot to come on, but obviously he shouldn't be the only one doing that. And you know, you're not allowing me to speak about Ricky, but I think it's quite obvious that there were other options that um, Conrad, for example, that would have been in a lot, in hindsight, in, in a lot of locations, would have been a better choice, or at least a choice that we would have liked to see instead. Yeah, or in addition to that was the point yeah. too that because he did it, the, the subs yesterday were one by one in three different segments, and that's what you're allowed to do. Well, technically it was four because of halftime, but you're allowed halftime. That doesn't count as one of your three stoppages. So. The four subs that came on yesterday came on one by one, which, I mean, yeah, I guess it helps the continuity and pace of a game because you're not throwing too many new faces on the field at the same time. But in that same way, uh, yeah, Trincao being the only option as an offensive player to come off the bench, um, just it hasn't worked. And I, again, put this on Coleman a little bit to manage Trincao a little bit better. If he's not, if he doesn't have the confidence or, I mean, we keep making jokes, but it's true where the arguments about Alenia and Puj and Puj in particular have been, 
that he's not training well. That's the, that was the, the buzz term this week, that he's not training well enough. Well, Trincao must be training incredibly because he gets into every match, but only for 20 minutes. So, I mean, it, in training, is Coleman saying, hey, he's 20 minutes training well, <laughs> so he's good enough to be put in those situations. But anyway, we're going to actually pivot almost completely. We're going to talk a little bit about the elections. I know people want us to really dive in deep, but we're not doing that. We're going to be more surface. We're going to be more reactionary to the news that came out this week. And actually, a pretty easy one for you. To Rob asks, Font talked about getting former players involved in running the club, and we expect Laporta would do the same thing to bring. I mean, <laughs> I say this in that Bartomeu, somehow, uh, he excluded legends in a way that I would think unfathomable. To, to, how can you upset Carlos Puyol? I, I, it boggles the brain. So any president that comes in is going to be nicer than, I think mean, you'd even think that Florentino Perez would be nicer to our, some of our former legends than Bartomeu was uh, and Rizal before him. So anyway, which former legends would you like to see getting involved in the club and in what capacity? Wow, good question. Yeah. Um, I think that Jordi Cruyff is the one that screams to me. Um, he's got a lot of experience, um, not in major clubs, to be honest, but he's got a lot of experience as a sporting director. And then I think that the greats of the 2007, 2013 era. So you got Puyol. Um, I think obviously David Villa is still playing, uh, or you know, he's about to retire, but I think Xavi, Puyol, Iniesta, Villa, even Pedro in some capacity. I think that those are the players that you want to you wanna have in, even Carlos Busquets and, and obviously Gerard Piquet himself, which I don't think will come as a sporting director or anything. I think Piquet will have his own candidacy in 10, 15 years' time, and he will yeah. definitely win in a landslide. So until that happens, I think that you need to, you need to have the players that know and understand Barca. And you could go further back. I think someone like Chapi Ferrer, for example, someone like Sergi Barjuan, um, they, they could do a service as well. I think Guillermo Amor, who's obviously working at the club as well, he's not a, a bad person to have. He understands the Barca way inside out. I mean, everyone wants us to talk about Pep Guardiola, but the thing is, Guardiola has got a very good contract in, in City. Um, he's very happy living in, living in England. Um, which I know I didn't want to make this transition, but it's what Xavi is saying. I live in Doha, as, as pretty much everyone knows that is listening to this podcast. Life in Qatar is very good if you are a person who's got a very good job. Uh, you can read between the lines of that one. And I totally understand why Xavi doesn't want to leave. And to be honest, I totally understand why Xavi's wife does not want to leave. You know, the, the weather here is fantastic. Um, he's got a job that pays him a lot of money. He's got literally no pressure from the press. I mean, the press here don't really talk about football. Um, it is in the back page. In, you know, there's two or, two or three new papers, newspapers, and he's at the back of it. But life is very easy. I mean, I, I bumped into Xavi going around the mall one day. And I just said, Xavi, Xavi, and went for an autograph. He took a picture of me, with me, and I said, thank you for everything you've done. And he walked away. He could not do that in Barcelona. So I think that, especially in Xavi's position, he must have his family, you know, he's got, he's got little girls, little children growing up and uh, they've got everything they need in life. They've got a fantastic villa. They've got a very cozy job that he enjoys. He's growing. Uh, the World Cup is coming in a couple of years. Um, you know, the, 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 the city, the country in itself is changing. He's been here longer than me, to be honest. And um, it is really exciting to see how everything is coming together. You know, the stadiums, there's three of them finished now. There's eight all together. They, they are incredible they you know top top notch um life here in terms of going to the hotels or, over the weekends you go to the beach um it's not crowded people to us to people like me and chavi they're really nice and they're really keen and really caring and really polite uh, i don't really see why chavi needs to go back to barcelona and us talking about him all the time and all the pressure of every single media outlet in the world all these tweets that he doesn't need it he really does not need it. So I think that he is, unless he pays, you know, it does hurt me to say this, but he, from a family perspective, he's totally right to stay where he is. He's getting paid big bucks. His family is happy and he's doing something that he enjoys. So why would he go back right now, especially to have to, you know, it's all messy, isn't it? Is he going to be the coach that says to Messi, actually don't stay with us? Or is he going to be the coach that says, Messi, please stay with us and Messi leaves? Or is he going to be the coach that, takes Messi and then fails Messi's one, two last years. He doesn't need that pressure. He really doesn't need it. And uh, I'm not on Twitter, uh, but I am in, on, on Facebook. And I was seeing what the, our listeners in the Facebook group were saying. 
And uh, it's just an added pressure that honestly, it comes to a point that you just don't need in life. And he's a World Cup winner. He's won 20 something collective trophies for Barca. He can take a break. He's a human being. He's entitled to take a break. And he's, he's been playing a La Masia from, I don't know, age eight or nine. He's been under, under the spotlight for 15, 16 years. He went elsewhere and he's quite enjoying not being the center of everything. And uh, I think that his family, especially his wife, really is doing that too. So I totally understand where he's coming from. Yeah, I mean, I want to go all the way back to the initial question about the former legends. You had a lot of good answers there. And you see the ones that have been football adjacent where Puyol's become an agent. So you'd think he'd be a candidate to return. Uh, I even picked Samuel Eto as somebody that has a, a different, kind of, different kind of ideas to add to it. And then you have other legends like a Victor Valdez that, um, I mean, it was doomed to start from Bartomeu, but unfortunately for Valdez, he seemingly has had a personality that hasn't really fit as a manager regardless of where he's been, whether it was the fourth division or um, at, at youth level. So Valdez is one of those ones that you question whether or not he just, he really is a fit to return to the club. But as I said, uh, Jordy, for, uh, Jordy Cruyff was uh, the first name you threw out to me, is also probably one of the best names that people mm -hmm. question because he's been in China. He's been in, uh, again, non-traditional places. But I also think uh, in the way that Pep Guardiola has taught us about the management style, the more locations and the more situations you have put yourself in, the better experiences you have. And I think yep. Jordi Cruyff has built a resume off the pitch of someone who is very well-rounded in the game that can bring a lot of good ideas, uh, whether that means he's a technical director. The whole point is, is even the people you put in charge do they put the right people around them? And so yeah. it's not just about the, the sporting director, the top, top job. It's about who is his number two, who is his number three. And so now not only are we talking about, you know, Abby Dahl having what I thought was being put in a position where he wasn't going to succeed, but the people under him in Planas, we question whether how good he's been. And going back to Pep Segura, we question how good he was for that job and the help that he had in those situations. So, uh, yeah. You've got other people as well, Dan, that I didn't mention. And I know that he's not having, um, let's just say, a fantastic walk. But Oscar Garcia, Ruggier yeah. Garcia, um, Garcia Pimienta himself, you know, that he's doing a great job. There's no, there's no reason to change that. And there is a plethora of other coaches. Like, for example, Tito Villanova, obviously, um, arguably our best coach ever with Guardiola. He was not a really good player himself. Sure. He never really made the first team and, um, you know, was one of the key players for Johan Cruyff at the time. But he understood the game perfectly well. So there may be players that um, ended up at Barca B that have got some connections with any of the players that I've mentioned that could do a fantastic job. And the thing is, they don't have to all be in the first team. They don't have to all be coaching um, alongside, supposedly, Xavi. It could, be, it could be in the Juvenil, Juvenil B, Cadete, Infantil, it could be anywhere. Um, it's just having Barca play in the right way, having affirmation, which we understand. We do get it that, you know, at first team level, sometimes you need to tweak and change and adapt. I get that. But Barca should be playing the same way and following the same philosophy throughout, not just as a patch, not just as a, this is what we do, this is the right way to do it, but actually physically do it week in, week out. And then we can get back to, to the team that we've always been. And we want to be in the future as well. Yeah, I mean, that's almost the good news I have since uh, Barca TV this year. I've been watching even more youth football than I normally do in terms of Barca stuff. And the, the good news is of, of every Barca match I watch, even though the results are coming for Barca B, and I'll talk about them on a, on a future show, um, I'm currently working on, as, as those know, my, I, I do twice a year at the midpoint of the year in the summer. And then for the winter, I do my, uh, the top five, basically, La Masia talents that are rising through the ranks and ones you should know. So I've been watching a, a bit of uh, uh, youth football to get caught up on that. And I can tell you that all these academy uh, teams that I've been watching are playing a similar way. And so the Barca way is just because the first team is having a tumultuous situation does not mean that the academy looks different than it was. If anything, as we've talked about, the academy has uh, it's almost been built back up. Not to say that Pep Segura did a, a number on it uh, because he had both good ideas and bad ideas. But the last few seasons, uh, we haven't really been talking about, or at least the last year, we haven't really been talking about the academy because you got Fati out of it and you've seen some of the other prospects going up to Barca B. I said it was a very young crew. You have Conrad Del Fuente poking in, Puj and Elena still trying to break into the first team. So while that bridge from the Barca B to the first team is still the one in question, the youth teams are still producing and still playing the right way, as you said. Now, I want to throw in my hat here on the Xavi point. 
try to make it even more succinct than you. I don't know how long he's going to stay in Qatar, but if you're going to sit him down for a press conference and ask him about the Barca presidency between Font and Laporta, two guys that he knows, of course he's going to jump out. And Rohit asked, does that hinder chances of Font winning the election? Absolutely. Absolutely. Xavi distancing himself from Font, but not necessarily because of Font, but because he doesn't want to ruffle feathers with Laporta. That does hurt Font's chances, certainly. And so, because Font, unfortunately for him, he's had a candidacy or a presidency bid that is about much more than just Xavi, but because of how closely he's tied himself to Xavi, just to get through the preliminary um, notion of having people talk about him, just to get the name cachet that Laporta has immediately that Font didn't have. He had to build up his resume, if you will, of getting people to talk about Richter Font. He did that by attaching himself to Xavi, but now that Xavi is taking that step back, that is, and this is just politics 101, is going to hurt his presidency, of course. Now, it is still just Font and Laporta in this, and you can't tell me that Xavi, who is, as I said, saying all the right things, as long as he's in Qatar, as long as he's in press conferences, sitting in that seat, he's going to be promoting the World Cup in 2022, and he's going to be promoting his time in that country. That's going to happen every time that he's in a press conference. However, the minute over the summer that Ronald Koeman is relieved of his duties, And whether it's Font or Laporta in charge of Barcelona, they just pick up the phone and I think that Xavi will come. That is, I mean, I I don't think we're disagreeing too much on that point. But my point is the things that Xavi is saying now are going to be the things that he's going to say until summer of 2021 when that job is potentially open. Now, Also, Dan, he doesn't have anything else to say. He cannot say anything else. Exactly. That's what he's going to say. That's the diplomatic thing to say. So I I think we, we can't necessarily read too much into it, but I think it's pretty... A, B, C. This is why he's saying the things he's saying, and this is what the, the path for him moving forward is going to be, whether it's Font or Laporta. Now, number two of that, though, is so, if somehow Coleman, this is another question from Mohit, if somehow Coleman is sacked, what are the chances that Garcia Pimienta is going to take over? And for that reason, of all that we talked about, the good and bad of Coleman, uh, Coleman, I think, is gone no matter what, whether they finish in the top four, or unfortunately, if Barca don't finish in the top four, which would be pretty cataclysmic, I mean, if you're, if you're the last month of the season, if it is April or May and Coleman is in seventh or eighth place, I mean, the only thing they may have is that new manager bump and try to get some, try to get some kind of a reaction. But uh, it's, it's odd to answer that question because we are waiting for a new president. And Laporta might come in the first day of his job and go, you know what, I actually kind of hate this Ronald Coleman guy. <laughs> and things could change immediately in, on, on January 30th it could all be very different and we could be having a different conversation. So I, I don't know. It's hard to say. I think at this juncture, both Font and Laporta would keep Coleman until the end of the season and sack him, whether it's to bring in Xavi or bring in a different name. Um, and as you said, for Garcia Pimienta, I actually, for what I see of him, yes, the Barca B results haven't been there, but the way that he develops players, I would love to see him as an assistant with the first team. That, that It doesn't mean that he would accept that job. Maybe he thinks he's a top manager and deserves to be in that position. But he's also been in the academy for so, so long. I think he would at least take a year, just like Tita Villanova. They, I mean, those two are very, very parallel in the way that they came up as academy coaches and they were not great players, but they were players that had played in Catalonia their entire career. So there mm-hmm. are parallels in their resumes. And so I would say that for Garcia Pimienta, you at least give him an opportunity to be an assistant. And so by putting him in that head coach job right away, does that ruin the opportunity that he might have moving forward? So that, you know, I think he would be a good option to take over for Coleman. If there's any name that I would have take over for Coleman if he is sacked, it is Garcia Pimienta. But it's, it's, it's almost answering the question by not answering it because I don't see Coleman sacked until the end of the year. Uh, That's the you know, point. To the summer, yeah. That's the point. Um, I don't disagree with what you said about Garcia Pimienta. I think you're, you're totally right. But I just don't see Kuma getting sacked. I really, really, really don't see the point. And it won't happen while Carlos Tusquets is in charge because, you know, he's an economics guy. He's a numbers guy. I'm sucking Kuman. You have to pay him the contract. So he just landed here. He's been here for five, six months. You're not going to pay him another year and a half because he signed two years, right? So that makes no economic sense. So, so he's not going to get sacked. And to be honest, even if Fonto Laporta come, I don't think they should sack Kuman at all. I think they should offer him a role maybe of the first team maybe um, like, a, like a scout, maybe like a director of some sort, maybe a La Masia or a Luca. I've got no idea. But Kuman is someone who understands the Barca way. Kuman is someone who's got the respect of everyone in Catalonia. You know? and, and I understand that 
you know, there may be some kids on Twitter who are 11 that never saw him play and don't quite understand where he's from. And they're thinking that he, this is another Kike Setien old man with a big belly. It's not the case. This is a Barca legend. He's got the respect of everyone. If you think about it, the Catalan media have not really, um, how can I say this, responded to his poor results in the way that people around the world want the Catalan media to respond. Why? Because he was one of the best players for Johan Cruyff's arguably the best team in Barca history, you know, Bar Pep Guardiola's dream team or, you know, whatever name we want to give them, the, the, the Messi team. That's it. He's someone who really understands the club. He's someone who's respected. He's someone who is a club legend. And he's someone who, if I was mentioning Oscar Garcia and Sergio Barjuan and Chapi Ferrer, he's in the same boat. So I think that he should not be sacked. I think that he should be offered a role that maybe as an ambassador of the club. I've got no idea. I'm not an expert in making organigrammas. You know, they, this is not my role. I just come here and talk about parts and stuff that I somehow know a little bit about, if, if anything. I've got, no, I've got no clue, but I really think that he is someone who will be valid for Barca and needs to be given a role. Whether he takes it or not is different because then he says, actually, no, I was coaching the Netherlands beforehand. I'm not going to be an ambassador for the club. Fine, then go away. Then you're free to leave. Thank you for your service. Go. But, you know, play, paying him money to leave the club, no. I think that it would be a nonsensical thing to do. Yeah, I agree. And it's sad to say, I know we did interview his twin brother, Ronald De Boer, but unfortunately, mm. Frank De Boer, his Netherlands results have been mixed. He didn't do so well at Atlanta United before that here in the U.S. So unfortunately for Frank De Boer, that job, that for Netherlands job might be up for grabs in the next two or three years as well. So Coleman might be able to jump right back in. Now, all that said, we're going to end the show here. For those who are normal listeners, you know, this is usually the point in the podcast where we end, but we have a special we'll say uh, holiday conversation, a little holiday treat to end this. So we might go over one hour. We apologize, but we, we only do it one or two times a year. I'll be so, quick, Dan. I'll be quick. Promise. Yeah, we're going to try to be quick. We do have Real Vital late. That's already tomorrow. Then it's all for the Christmas holiday, but there's still a match next Tuesday before the New Year as well. And I also want to mention before we get into our final segment, get well soon to Musa Wage. He may never play oh, yes. for Barcelona again, but I hope that he does play first team football once again. I, I, I mean, the injury, don't watch it. It's pretty gruesome, but he got hurt. In for at least nine months, he'll be out to his knee in Greece. And so we, we do wish our, our kindest well wishes to Musa Wage. Um, you know, it's this weird thing where I know players are sold, but unless your name is Luis Figo, if you're part of the Kool-Aid family, you're always part of the Kool-Aid family, even if, um, and I thought he was a good buy at the time. Yes, he, he hasn't, he's been out on loan and it hasn't worked. But again, if you are if you're selected to play for Barcelona, um, and you don't leave the club in the way that Luis Figo does, then you are always part of the Barca family. And we're always going to keep tabs on those former Barca players as well. Um, even Boyan Kirkic, I watch him. I mean, yes, I watch every MLS game because of work, whatever. But um, I watch, I still keep up with Boyan, whether he was at Stoke City or whatever, because uh, I do care about what happens to these players that you care about so much and you want them to succeed as a camp no or elsewhere. And so he's a player that I want to succeed no matter where he is. And I hope he plays first team football again. So it's a, it's a sour note, but we're going to end on a positive. Zach had asked us, can you give us some positives to end the year on? And I thought, let's take that one step better and make this a little bit of holiday edition. I'm going to throw out a name here, Frances, and we're going to take turns. What gift would you give to this player? And now for so much, basically half our squad, it's I would give them a clean bill of health and give them goals. But those two don't count. I, I'm not going to give you. So unfortunately, I'm not even going to ask you Samuel Umtiti's name because, yes, obviously the gift you give Samuel Umtiti is being 2018 Samuel Umtiti before the knee injury. So I almost don't need to tell you what, what we can give Samuel Umtiti. So the other names we're going to throw out, we need to be a bit more creative than just goals and injury stuff. So first name, Lino Messi. I would give him a crystal ball so he can see what he's going to do in the future. <laughs> I think he knows what he's going to do in the future. But uh, for, uh, number two is Dembele. I guess I'll take this one. I would give Dembele, yes, obviously a clean bill of health, sure. But I would give Dembele a run of 10 good matches to show you exactly what he's got because I think that he is a world-class player. Still, there's a world-class player in there just waiting to come back out. How about Coutinho? I would give Coutinho a map so he knows where to play in the pitch. I mean, I might give him a map of uh, another country, maybe maybe of the UK again, <laughs> if he knows where he wants to go. But all right, how about uh, uh, Alenia? I'll take this one, and I say for Alenia, I want him to have the next season of his career be the one where he breaks out. 
So I don't know how, what gift to give him for that. I don't know, maybe a new pair of boots that he can uh, lace up in training and just feel like he still has a lot to give to this club and that he is still at the beginning of his career. I don't want him to feel like he's too old. Uh, how about, I mean, you knew this one was coming. Number 12, Ricky Pouch. Ricky Pouch needs a chill pill. He needs to take it easy, continue to work hard, and his time will come if he's patient enough. All right. Uh, for Ansu Fati, again, yeah, the injury thing. But for Ansu Fati, I would say I would give him an app that limits his screen time because I think that Ansu Fati is, a, is uh, one of the best young talents in world football. He was the number two in the Golden Boy, runner up to Erland Holland. I think the whole world is aware of how good Ansu Fati is, and we got to have to make sure that he doesn't know that for just a little bit longer until he extends his contract. So I would say I'd want a screen lock app for Ansu Fati. I, I'm, I'm going to give you Shugino Dest. I, I was going to take it, but um, I would give him the world. So we know that. So how about you, Francis? What would you give Shugino Dest? Shugino Dest just needs a motorbike, um, like Dani Alves used to have, just to go forward a little <laughs> bit more and be able to associate in the ways that um, Alves was. I think he just needs time, to be honest. But, you know, a motorbike to speed him up even more would be even better. Uh, the next one is Jordi Alba. Now, I would, my gift for Jordi Alba, and it's unfair because he's another <laughs> player in the squad, but I would give him Junior Furpo as a gift for Christmas. And that is a Junior Furpo that is in form and is ready to take over some minutes. Uh, and that's what I would give Jordi Alba. It would be a well in form Junior Furpo so that he doesn't have to play as much and that he can start his transition out of the club. I would give Jordi Alba a mouth and he can put it over his so we don't hear him moaning that much. Yeah, maybe, yeah, in the, in the days of masks, Maybe we should have Jordi Alba wearing his mask all the yeah. time. That's a good idea. You're right. Yeah. He is, I, I can't think of a player in the squad that has been uh, – I mean, he is called the squirrel for a reason. That, it's a nickname for a reason. Uh, how about Sergio Busquets? Sergio Busquets needs um, – needs, to be honest, he just needs his seat on the bench to be clean for him. Yeah. Unfortunately. Yep, it's unfortunate. Yep. Uh, Pjanic – I would give him, uh, I, would, I would take him to the passport office and I would give him a renewed passport because for Pjanic, I look at the deal that brought him in for Arthur. And when Pjanic is looking around and saying, where are my minutes? My answer would be that you were actually not bought to play for Barcelona. You were bought because both Juventus and Barcelona had to balance their books. And that's unfortunate because you are a very, very, very good player, but maybe you will never fit at Barcelona because you're already 30. And I don't need to ask you to change your, I don't need to ask Piana to change his game. I need to ask him to change his club again. Uh, it's unfortunate, but you wind up selling Arthur the very next year, maybe over the summer, you consider selling Pjanic because there's so many talented midfielders ready to come up through the system that Pjanic is redundant, uh, especially if Busquets has one or two more years as a bench player. So Pjanic, yeah. that's what I would give him. Unfortunate, I would say uh, get ready for a summer move. Um, or I'd buy him a house in Italy. How about that? So he can return to where he's played his best. He's been great in Italy and he, he seems to be fitting really well in Serie A. And somehow I gave you the other American here on our list. This is the final one on the list that I had had, and it is Conrad de la Fuente. Conrad de la Fuente just needs to continue what he's doing. So he would just needs, he just needs health. He just needs to continue to be healthy, continue to be persevering. And, um, you know, I would wish him to play full matches for Barca B until he's ready. But obviously, he needs to be in Dinamica de Primer Equipo, which is being in the dynamics of the first team, which is why he's not playing the 90 minutes all the time. But if he's training with the first team alongside Messi and under the eyes of Kuman, I think that that's what he needs to do. Just persevere, keep going. So he needs health and time. And the last one, uh, it's not Gerard Piquet, but I actually think that Gerard Piquet should give the entire squad the pants that he wore against Real Sociedad. I know they got a lot of hate on the internet, but I think that this team needs an intimidation factor. They've lost that intimidation factor. Teams aren't scared anymore. But if all of them come out in those Gerard Piquet pants, I think you're going to have the opponent not afraid, but confused. And confused enough to get in a few goals. And that's what Barcelona need. They need a few goals. They need a, good, a few good results here in a row. And they've got a, a tough second half of the season. But we will be here for that as well. So I want to say once again to not only all of our listeners, but to you, Frances, happy holidays. Merry Christmas to you, my friend, yep, and Merry to everyone Christmas listening. To you and all of our listeners who we want to thank for tapping in and sharing this whole 2020 year, not season, but 2020 year with us. So you can tap, tap in the app, 
check out the show notes to subscribe to the show. Find us on social media. We'll be there again all year long on Twitter at the Barcelona Pod or at Hilton D13 for me or on Instagram at the Barcelona Pod. Our closed Facebook group where we got these listener questions from is tvpod.link backslash group. Deeper dive discussions and all of that. And you can help us continue to make these shows as you have been so gracious to do. I'm very, very thankful. You want to talk about being thankful for the holiday season? I'm so thankful for our Patreons who have helped make these shows tvpod.link backslash Patreon. We're also on YouTube, and I want to thank especially all the new followers we've gotten in 2020 on YouTube. This has been the year for YouTube blowing up, uh, not blowing up, but we're growing on YouTube, and I've been so excited to see those who uh, are part of a, a new YouTube community for the Barcelona podcast. So that has been great to see as well. Thank you to all of you. You can check us out there and hit that subscription button if you're not already. But for this, this is the podcast. So thanks so much for listening to the Barcelona podcast. Until next time, we'll talk to you soon. And force the bar side. Force out.